Ooh, welcome back to Big Content. We're up bright and early. Got a coffee size of my head, so you know we're ready to rip today. Is our first is our first AM shooting? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Actually, I think our time was at eleven thirty back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day, like a month ago. <laughs> The history of this pod. Yeah. How long have we been doing it for? Uh, to be honest with you, it feels like um, feels like a long time. Really? Feels well, like a long time. Is that a good thing? Uh, it, I don't know. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I think it doesn't matter. It feels like, I want to say, not that long, because I feel like once you're doing something for a long time, you're expecting like you know a lot to come from it, but also, I don't know. Like It's just kind of part of the routine of my week now. You know, so it's like, uh, how long have we been doing it? Four months, maybe? Five months? Yeah, four or five months. Yeah. But before we know it, we're going to be a year deep into this. Yeah. And then two and then five. So it's part of your routine, but our routine is being disrupted. The summer, Jackie summer, you know, like uh, I'm all over the place. Where are you next week? So despite my despite my reluctance to, to leave the city, I ha- I'm going to visit my grandparents down in Florida. And then my sister moved out to Denver last year and I haven't gone to visit her yet. Which I'm just saying, if there's a game seven, yeah. it's in Denver while I'm there. Yeah, I wish I could say I haven't visited her in Denver. But let me let me ask. Um, it was nice seeing her on Monday. What what uh what's the price of that game going to be? Game seven if it's in Denver. Game seven, like un- get in price like twelve hundred probably. Really, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, I could do that. Think was, about it. I was Super expecting Bowl's, like nine grand. Super Bowl is like three, four grand. Uh, get in, and there's seven of the game. That's so. probably worth it. I've been actually thinking about this a little bit more. As someone who's like whose life revolves so heavily around sports, I don't know if I've ever actually been to like a real big time sporting event. You know, like playoffs where the things are like super heated and yeah. everything. I mean, I guess I, ha- I went to like the Knicks playoff yeah. last year, but that was like first round. We got knocked out in fucking yeah. six games, whatever it was. But like. I haven't been to a big time event, and I'm like, maybe Game Seven of the NBA Finals would be pretty fucking cool. They're not going to get to seven, but if they did, that'd be cool. It could. It definitely could. I wouldn't doubt Miami's ability to to push it, but yeah, Denver takes I, it in five. I would hire. Someone was asking me this weekend, like, is Snapback your only business that you'll ever do? I said I would imagine that at some point in the future there'll be there'll be another one. And not like variations of it, like a brand new business. And then the follow-up question was, are you going to walk, uh, work in sports forever? And I said, I think I will, even if it's just like tangentially there, because I'm obsessed with like the passion of sports. And I think a game seven, any playoff atmosphere, I always say Super Bowl is the most special event of the year. Like there's just that energy and the vibe because you've got the two split fan bases, but you've also got like the corporate business people there as well that makes it high profile with all the celebrities. So yeah, highly would would highly recommend getting to a uh, game with high stakes. What would you do in sports if you weren't like, I feel like what is there to do in sports besides make content, like do media shit about it <laughs> what do you and mean? be like There's an a agent. million things. Yeah. But not that you can manage talent. You could even run an investment fund that you invest in sports products. You could, you know, you could, uh, you could create basketballs. Like, I mean, yeah, but that's not reasonable for you to do. Why? You're not creating basketballs. I'm creating a basketball shoe in the future. Let's be reasonable here. We've it's early, but I know this. like that's We've not. We've talked issues. about this. That's that's gonna come down the line. Uh, yeah. Air two point Yeah, but you can except only except my shoe would be called ground. You can only do that I'm, because you do what you do now. Yeah, I, I'm not saying uh, that that wasn't the point. It wasn't like I'm not like trying to be like Gary Vee. Like I hope they take it all away from me and I'll start from <laughs> scratch. Like. No, I, I'm saying if I complete this business to the fullest extent, then what would I do? I would probably start another business within the realm of sports. Okay. I don't think I would. I think I would do a product-focused business. But could it be a sports product focus? Maybe. I, I don't know what the product would be, but it would be... The, whatever the business was, it would be super content-focused. Right. I would guesstimate that it would have a tie to sports and even mine or yours yours even if it's a seltzer i think you might want to have it sponsor you know Maybe. like like i'm saying i would never have people sponsor any product <laughs> I, mean, I no, want you would sponsor i, I want it pure and raw yeah right. but i guess if you're saying it's all built around content then you wouldn't need to sponsor stuff so uh anyways anyways yeah, yeah i'll be gone next week which <clears throat> a couple months ago is this I think it's, vacation or work? It sounds it's, like vacation. It's vacation, which is why you could. I hate it. <laughs> like I hate it. 
a, a few months ago, I was like, man, I'm really going to uh, enjoy myself this summer. You know, like the last few summers, I feel like I've worked just like nonstop and I'm always like overwhelmed and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what, this summer I really want to like have a, a good social life and enjoy myself. So I booked this trip a few months ago and I was like, I'll be gone for a week. And it's the only vacation I'll probably take this summer. And now that it's here, I'm like, fuck, dude, I'm so locked in and I have, I have so many things that I need to get done by the time I get there. And now I don't, not that I don't want to see my family, obviously, but I don't want to go. So I'd imagine I'm going to be working a lot. Like, I wish they were here. Like, if you could, if, if my grandparents could spend four days in the office with me, awesome. <laughs> that would be your dream. Vacation. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my I dream. mean, I, I, it's very spoiled to me, but same feeling. Like, I'm going on a two week yeah, like I could vacation, never. <laughs> Italy and Croatia this summer. That's pretty locked in. And it's just like, of course, that's the fucking time, but also it's going to like, like, I'm going to lose my mind. I know that. Well, let's 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 talk about this a little bit because I think there's a few different angles for especially newer creators. Um, I think there's like the burnout angle. I think there's the FOMO angle as well where I feel FOMO and not necessarily like me versus these other people who are going to be making content next week when I'm not. Because I, what I'll do is I'll double up on work this week. I'll basically make sure I make videos like over the weekend that will go out, you know, Tuesday, Friday, whatever. And... I feel like a FOMO, like I generally have felt this way since I started doing this, that if I take like one or two days off, I'm falling behind from like where I want to be. It's just going to take me longer to get to wherever I want to be. And I understand it's like a very psychotic way to look at the work that we're doing, but it does feel like in this line of work, you stack up momentum and you never know when that like one at bat is going to be the thing that, you know, gets you. I think about this all the time when we put out like a popular video, the one I put out yesterday is by far the most well-performing one we've done in in months at this point it got it, it was up to like 10,000 views in like a couple hours and I was like cool this will end up ripping to like 50k by the end of like next week or something like that and I'm like now summer starting this yeah. is when like our summer starts and I think about like what if I just woke up yesterday and just like had a headache didn't make that piece of content and then we didn't grab that momentum to push it into like the rest of the summer and I think about that I think about that pretty often you ever you ever think about stuff like that like you ever get kind of like FOMO in terms of like what you're missing out on for work. Like you're gone for two weeks. That's, that's a long time. Like, do you already have kind of a schedule of what you're going to do content wise there? My, mine's a different fear. And it's like, I don't, I've gotten to the point where the business can run without me, which is a, a very big step, but also it, it can kind of run on the back burner for two weeks. Like it won't accelerate. It won't continue that momentum. Yeah. Like you said, at least that's how I feel. Hopefully the team proves me wrong, but I know like how we've positioned the company that me as talent and also me running the business that it's very important when I'm there that, you know, the business is going to keep going forward. So I wouldn't say it's FOMO as much as, and also, I mean, you're taking off in the middle of your season. That That's, that's why like if a, this was like March or something like that, yeah. not really that big of a deal. But now that I feel like we are getting momentum, I hate to be like, but if, you can, if you can stack it and do the work ahead of time, like, I could stack it. There's also a lot of other stuff. Like we have the videos. Noah's not making content for June because he's studying for the LSATs, which means I kind of got to double down on content. Uh, Sexy Leaves has to go back to Canada like two days after I get back. We're in the middle of our intern search, which we're closing <laughs> off on Friday. And we have like, oh, at this point, I, don't, I haven't checked it today, but we're probably at like 120 applications. Yeah. And I'm like, we're going to have to cipher through those. And then I want someone in the office by the time Sexy Leaves, which is again, two days after I get back. So like that entire time I'm there, I'm like, but that does feel like work you could potentially get some of. It can, uh, but yeah. it's just like shit that I'm going to have to. It's not vacation yeah. but is basically what I'm saying, do, I guess. But does that matter to you? Like, are you going to be missing a pickleball game or are you going to be just like sitting by the pool doing work? Yeah, you know what probably I mean? that. Yeah, like, I, you know, someone asked me, you know, it, within that conversation about sports and what I would do in the future is like, do you are you able to turn your mind off? And I was like, to be honest, as a business owner, no, like you can't really shut down. Although I tried to do that on Saturday and I shut down in a different way. I was just like thinking and I wasn't actively doing stuff. I can't shut down, but then the question is asked, like, well, are you burnt out? Do you need to? And I say truthfully, like, I don't need to right now. I'm fine. I enjoy. I want to be able to sit by the pool, but I'm fine being on my computer. Like, instead of watching a show or scrolling Twitter, is like, yeah, I'll answer some interns. Yeah. And just for everyone who wants to understand Nick's app process, you just got to take your shirt off and send him a picture. To Dude, get the eligible. applications are fucking insane some of them like what are they doing 
What are they doing? That, you've built an amazing community. I think that's a really good sign. What do you mean? Why? None of them take it seriously. They just fucking make a video with their shirt off. But are are they not serious? I mean, they're, they're serious in the way that, like, they would love if I gave them the job. But the application... Basically, what I did was I told Sexy and Tony, I'm like, I don't have time to look at 115 applications. Mm-hmm. I need you guys on Friday are going to choose your top five each and you're going to present them to me basically. So they're looking through all the applications and they're going to present the top five to me. And they're talking about like these guys, like one of the requirements is to submit a video. It doesn't have to be long. It could be 30 seconds. It could be 30 minutes. It doesn't fucking matter. But 90% of them just literally just pick their phone up when they're in bed, make a video being like, Oh, I'm like hardworking. I know ball, whatever, et cetera. And it's like funny and cute, whatever. Yeah. But if you put, they all act like they can't make more than one take of their phone. Like all the, all the videos are just so low effort. You know what I mean? And I'm like, if you just thought about what you were going to say, maybe a little bit before or planned out some sort of video, you're automatically vaulted right, into the top, top 10 of things. <laughs> yeah. Like we'll watch a video and be like, this is pretty good. Automatically like above 80% of the fucking applicants and stuff. So they're just doing the bare minimum to try to get it. I'm like, that's just like, I understand you live in the TikTok era, but that's yeah. not how the real world works. I think that is a great demonstration Mm. of my belief that if you're intelligent and you work like an extra four percent than the average person you're already miles ahead of everyone else 100 percent. you should see like in and some of the videos are not even that good but you could tell that they put the effort in it and that they want it you know and and what that can do is like maybe you didn't submit the best video but now i look at the rest of your resume holistically Mm -hmm. and maybe you have experience working on the video team at whatever college you're at and maybe and there's some applications that come through that are like i'm a software engineer and i'm like okay you're probably not like really that good enough to like build out what we want right now but you could be a useful asset to the team so it's not it's just the the holistic effort of what you're trying to put in is also what you'll get back out of it so it's like funny seeing those through yeah but i'm also like i don't know what you guys you know you guys are ridiculous, you know. For someone who's not looking at any of the applications, it seems like you've looked at a lot of. Well, the because they share all of them, like they'll just like take pictures and be like, "Next, like the scoreboard <laughs> of shirt shirt list of shirts." Yeah, is is like crazy. Um, so I don't know. I just uh, that that's that's I guess why I don't want to leave right now, and it's because I don't feel burnt out. Like I'm really like up and passionate about what I'm doing right now, and I feel in a really good uh, a really good workflow. But I remember when I first started making content if i was on vacation somewhere like you you could you could fucking bet your life that the next two weeks of content the background of my video was going to be like wherever i was staying during that you know whether it was fucking florida san diego texas didn't really matter i used to like bring recording equipment with me camera and stuff so like i don't want to discourage people from doing that shit like you should you can plan ahead and try to do that as well but if you're really in this game like if you're really a creator you're going to create wherever you are so i think Bringing the equipment is not crazy. You're when you do that in the beginning, wherever you're staying, people are probably going to look at you weirdly. But I promise you, anyone who has gone through that in the beginning of what they're doing is ha, has done that before. So don't so don't get discouraged doing that shit. Like work yeah. work through that. Wi Fi issues, lighting issues, Fuck it. all that stuff. It, it's going to happen. Content but, is king. Yeah. All right, let's talk about our first topic of the day. Uh, this is actually a late ad, and it's our first topic of the day. So, <laughs> Frankie La Pena. Do you know him? He is a short form creator. He wears like Kim Kardashian butt, essentially. I'm sure you've seen him if if I were to show you content. He's got like a fat. He ass. has a Kim Kardashian butt. It's like a fake butt that he wears, okay. and he does content around it. So like running the 40 yard dash, but it looks hilarious because his ass okay. is jiggling. Anyways. It was really interesting. He's a 25-year-old creator. He's got millions of followers across all platforms. He's worked with the biggest brands in, you know, sports, but also around sports. And he posted and gave some really good insight into what he made off his most viral video. So he took a video, which was him getting pretty much knocked out in a either UFC ring or some martial arts ring. With the butt? Like, he's wearing the butt. He gets punched and then maybe lands on it. It actually had less to do with the butt, which is rare for his content. But 209... <laughs> he's just in the middle of the boxing with a huge ass, but, like, no one's actually paying Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 293 million views on the short. How much money do you think he made on YouTube? Like, off of AdSense? Yeah, YouTube shorts. Uh, 250 bucks, maybe. $2,000. 2000 bucks. Yeah. 293 million views. And he put it in perspective. It was more than the Endgame trailer 
which had 250 million views. Now, it's it's a very interesting look into, you know, short form creators because I'm sitting here as originally maybe a short form creator uh, who's trying to attack the long form. And I almost wonder, is it a sense of entitlement to think that he deserves more than that? So some of the other numbers on it, he grew 450,000 subscribers. That's 10% of his subscriber base on YouTube from one video. The average watch time is 14 seconds. So people are watching the entire thing, but it's only a 15 second <laughs> I love video. That. People are watching the whole thing, all 14 seconds. Exactly. So, and then the final stat is 60,000 views on average on his long form uh, content. So I don't think he was coming at it from a place of entitlement. The way he did it was like he wanted to showcase and, and mm-hmm. have transparency. And then to say, Just so you guys know, I don't make a lot of money off short form content creation. This is why I work with brands. So what are your overall thoughts? I guess I I like the conversation path of talking about entitlement when it comes to that. Just because entitlement comes from a certain level of expectation. And we've been hammering this home. The expectation for long form versus short form content should not, it should be so different. Mm -hmm. You know, like the short form content, again, unless you are wildly creative with an advertisement that you can make for your product. I almost think all short form content should be top of the funnel Mm -hmm. in order to figure something out down the line. Again, whatever your conversion is, it might be to bring on talent. It might be to sell a product. It might be to work with brands. It might be to get hired by brands, whatever it is. That is what you should be looking to do over the long run. But these top of the funnel things, how do you expect someone to build like loyalty through a 10 second video it's it, it, it's kind of insane and i think with him specifically what he can do though based off these videos a million ideas went through my mind in terms mm-hmm. of like products like if he's really that popular i don't really know who he is he maybe stickers recently stickers would work yeah. if he's popular enough amongst like the gen z population or whatever he could sell whatever butt thing he has in his fucking pants. Yeah. He could sell that. Like he can make his own and be like, be me for Halloween. I bet right. you that launch would make fucking yeah. 5 million and he'd be good for the year. Yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of different things that I think would work based off what he's doing, but the content itself. And I don't think that you should even look at the content itself on YouTube long form as like your main driver of revenue. Again, these platforms serve as distribution. They serve as a marketing platform. As soon as the views go down on a specific platform, you shift over to a new marketing platform. You know, it's just it's just foot traffic in and out, right? Like every creator is a mom and pop store, right? And when people walk into your store, depending on how you present yourself, if your store is clean, if your background is clean, if your shit is clean, people will want to stay in there longer. If you have a good deal at the front of the fucking store, if you have a good deal, whatever, if someone walks in immediately and then if you walk into a store and someone's like comes up to your face with a product and you're like, would you like to buy this? You're like, oh, dude, I'm, I'm leaving. If someone as a content creator does that, you immediately start a piece of content and they're like, buy this shit. Mm-hmm. You're like, I don't want to watch this piece of content. I, I look at it as the same exact kind of thing. You treat your content as if you are a mom and pop store. People feel more welcome if you are creating high quality experiences, high quality products, etc. So with him, um, again, I don't know his content, so I can't really reference it, but that type of volume will lead to good things down the line. I'm not surprised that he makes no money off the, yeah. the content itself. I, I, it might be backwards for a lot of people who are not in our position, but ironically, as a content creator, like the last thing that you should be thinking about in terms of making money is purely straight off actual content. Like if you rely on these platforms, you're relying on something that is vanishing or changing all the time. Well, the YouTube long formers, I think they rely on, on monet- content monetization. I, I wouldn't say they rely on it, but you could definitely it's get a huge to, part of their business. You can definitely get to a point where you're making a lot of money off yeah. it. I don't want to say nobody yeah. can do it because there's definitely a lot of people that can. But do even it. even like, do you know Cody Sanchez? She's like a finance. Yeah, yeah, type. yeah. She makes you know gets a million views a video, and it's a in a highly a high CPM category. Yeah. But even her, she's monetizing with courses and consulting and stuff like. If you're that. those types of view counts and you don't have your own product, I mean, yeah. you are. Yeah. I mean, you're set up to to make it and do well there, but I, it, that's just to me a complete lack of like awareness and business acumen on yeah. on multiple levels. But what I'm saying is like, if you're trying to become a full time content creator, like projecting to say, "Hey, I'm going to make my revenue off of the platforms," is like the longest path to take. There are a million ways to get there way quicker. Working with brands, selling your product, whatever it is. So, yeah. 
I, I people have this notion that like these platforms should be paying you a lot. It's like, no, you shouldn't expect to be making a full time living off the platforms. Well, I would say I don't mind that mentality, which is an expectation that if you're contributing, you know, a ton to a platform and the reason why the platform is kind of going that you're entitled to some of that revenue. But I'm going to focus on the fact that 14 second average watch time. And so to use your mom and pop example, imagine someone walks into your store for 14 seconds. Yep. What are the chances, you know, as opposed to a 12 minute excursion you know they can check out shirts and hats and a 12 minute excursion shoes. where you're having a conversation with the person behind the desk if they're yeah. like a pleasant person you're yeah. way more likely to buy something from that person so i think that's a yeah. you know another good and way so to look at and it. so like we released a gaming video yesterday and the watch time's 14 minutes so it's 100 times longer in terms of in mm-hmm. terms of watch time and just think about with 14 seconds how much ad space is there so I don't think you can expect to monetize yeah, off of another the 14 seconds. Yeah, it's like what the ads are going to be three seconds right. tops within the. But the way they're doing it is they do. A four, yeah, it's like 14 seconds, 14 seconds. Okay, so you got a minute, then we hit you with an ad. So even if you're 293 million, you're 293 million, like you're one fifth of the viewership before ads are shown. I also think the tough part about that is like, uh, I guess it's different, but YouTube. I mean, the YouTube, YouTube ad- ads are like 15 seconds. They can be. Someone was telling me that uh, they're like, yeah, I like fell asleep the other day with YouTube on and they just ran like a four hour ad. Before my video. Some of the ads are really, really long. If you four don't hours? if you don't skip them, they'll put like full ass like who would, cra- who, crazy videos. What does that even mean? Who could advertise for four hours? It's just like a piece of con- I, I forget what the context yeah. was, but I've seen ads that are super, super long. Yeah. If you just let them rip for long, some people will use their video that they've made like a long form video right, right. and use that as an ad beforehand. So they just upload it. It might be like an hour long or whatever, but it's really, yeah, YouTube. I feel like the YouTube ad world is just like a fucking it's crazy jungle. Next. I, I also okay. think just going back on that, I just want to make one more point is like the expectations of that. The reason people have those expectations is because there's such a lack of transparency mm-hmm. within the creator world, because you see the David Dobrik's of the world, who you just get a billion views and then you see a mansion in Lamborghinis and you just right. assume they're all from YouTube AdSense, but if more creators opened up about the money they made with sponsors or like the products that they're selling or stuff like that, uh, people going down that path would have a way more realistic expectation, but more importantly, like they would be able to plan accordingly right. and understand what they wanted to do in the future and say, Hey, instead of just focusing on like this one thing, maybe over the next two years, let's also focus on like building out this product. So when the time comes, we have a really good product and we've built an audience over those two years. Cause I realized that's, what's going to end up making me the revenue rather than just hoping that I go viral and get a billion views. Yep. So views. A lot of it is transparency. Views don't pay, but the Saudis do <laughs> live and PGA have merged together. Why are we talking about this today? A few reasons. First off virtue signaling. So I am proud to say I was on the camp in the camp of when all the live golfers who did take the deal, I said the ones who didn't were silly. I understand ethically, morally, that there's a conversation to be had. But Colin Coward did a nice job of explaining on his show yesterday and saying, I don't know everyone's you know, position. I don't know how they feed their family. I don't know how they do all these things. So, so, of course, there are times where in business there are morals and ethics that come into play. But it seems at the end of the day, no matter how strongly you feel about that, and Jay Monahan, who's the president of the PGA Tour, even took the route of 9-11 and how there were support groups who didn't agree with the golfers leaving for the Live Golf Tour. And, you know, now it's kind of making him look pretty silly, I would say. So with everything that's happened over the last few years, it, you know, I'm Jewish. There's been the Black Lives Matter movement. There's been COVID, politics. There's everything is out there, right? So there's been a lot of, you know, I don't know if virtue signaling is like a negative connotation or if it's just I think like, it is. A, yeah. So when is the right time? Because I've posted stuff and shared stuff that I believed in, but I'm sure there's a lot of creators who are, who felt pressure to speak out. And then it kind of spirals into the situation where, all right, if you speak out about this, are you required to speak out about this? Are you required to speak out in general? This whole situation, what's your general approach to it? Really good question. I, hmm. Admittedly, I, I don't put a ton of thought into it. I just, I either kind of let it come to me or I don't mm-hmm. 
go out and address it. I don't feel like every fight is my fight. Right. But if I do feel strongly about stuff, then I will speak out on it. And it's not because I feel the pressure from the audience to say something. It's because internally yeah. I feel a certain way about it. Like the BLM movements. Like I went on the marches and I made actually the first couple like – when I started the podcast, Why You Yelling, that was a mm. daily podcast that I did that was like five to ten minutes long for a few months. And I actually did it based off of being inspired by Eric Nardini, the CEO of Barstool. She started a daily podcast during COVID because she was like, I just want to kind of document my thoughts and everything that's going on during COVID because mm. it'll be cool to look back on. So I was like, "That that's a cool idea. I want to start doing the daily podcast for it. And I remember one of my first few episodes was about BLM. And as I was recording... Or right before I was recording, there was like a huge, it wasn't even, it wasn't like an organized march. It was just kind of like madness going on outside of my apartment. And I remember <clears throat> I was on the ground floor. It was when I lived in Hell's Kitchen. I had the window open. It was at nighttime too. And a huge group of people walked by and they started yelling into my window. And at first I was like scared, but they were just, you know, yelling, just whatever. No, nothing like negative and they're like, what are you filming in there? And I was like, I'm filming a podcast on, you know, BLM or whatever. They're like, tell them I said, what up? I was like, it was like a, it was like a cool experience when it happened, like live in real time. But the entire podcast episode and probably a few of them that week were situated on it because I had strong opinions towards right. it, you know? And a lot of those times, like I got a lot of messages reaching out to me after it being like, I really appreciate you taking a stance on this and like standing up for it. I would never insert myself into a situation where one, I'm not knowledgeable about it Two, And I don't, I don't really like to force myself to be knowledgeable about things. It's either like I'm passionate about it and I actually really care and want to speak on it. Or I go out of my way to like learn about it. And I feel like that's for me personally, what I found is like, that's not the right path for me. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have like a real intrinsic pull towards something, I typically stay out of that lane. You know, what do you think the responsibility is of someone with a platform? Because you have fantasy football content, right? Mm -hmm. That's the core of your business. So if, you know, things happen in, in the real world outside of our fantasy lands, maybe there's not a responsibility. One thing that I've been told before that I now think about is, you know, we use a lot of different athletes of color in our content and people think that we have a responsibility because we monetize through very back, you know, channel ways off of people of color. So when they are being discriminated against or they are being, you know, if things happen, that that's our responsibility. Me as a, a white person, I, I don't know if you feel like you've ever had that conversation, if you feel responsibility, uh, but what is the responsibility of someone with a platform who isn't directly in it, but you could obviously relate things to it. Yeah, another, I guess, like difficult question to necessarily answer because we, I mean, everyone in our office has been just a white male around, mm -hmm. you know, our age or whatever, but that's, that was like my experience growing up. Like those were the people I was around and those are the people, everyone that's in the office is naturally fit into the office. You know, mm -hmm. sexy came and was like, I'm moving out to New York. I'm sleeping in the office. If like, th there wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like I was going out and searching for this opportunity or that. I was like, yeah. oh, I need to decide between a white person, a Hispanic person, a black person. Yeah. If, if a Hispanic person wanted to sleep in the office for three months, I'd hire them as well. For yeah. me, as bad as it sounds, and maybe this is a, a naive way to look at it, I try to focus on what's going on in my life internally. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm responsible for me. I'm responsible for the people that I tell I'm responsible for the people within the office, my family, my friends and stuff like that. I try not to, I'm trying to figure out the way to word this without sounding extremely like asympathetic, but I think there's a lot of, and this is not for like people of color. I just mean in general, I think mm -hmm. there, there needs to be more of like a conversation around just general accountability for people. I think a lot of people like to blame politics and they like to blame this and they like to blame that. And it's like, you're doing that as a way for you to just like, say something right to like fill the void of the things that you're not doing mm -hmm. being like blaming this and blaming that and blaming that and i'm like when you wake up on a daily basis and yes there are obviously things that do affect you depending on your race and your political views and things like that 99 percent of the choices you make are internal choices that will actually dictate the outcome of your life you choose to wake up every day and a healthy breakfast eat fruit and eat eggs or you choose to eat donuts like those kind of 
choices will With, make without getting too deep into it yeah. i think yes and no like there are people who are put in positions where it's much cheaper to eat donuts than it is to have a healthy breakfast that's fair yeah so i, ju I just want to protect against all because i'm generally switzerland in, in the situation uh that's fair and i've also not yeah. been yeah i haven't been in, in all those situations where i can be empathetic because i haven't gone through those things exactly. but i i whenever there's these types of like external arguments and, and things going on i'm typically like i'm putting my head down and i'm just i'm, I'm doing the work for me you yeah. know and it's not like it's easy for me to sit here as a white male mm -hmm. but like i've also you know i grew up without a dad my dad passed away my mom didn't go to college she raised like me and my sister mm -hmm. so it's like i've had enough of my own hard times to be able to relate to people who didn't have a leg up like we didn't i didn't grow up in a house like my friends did you know it was not the same situation mm -hmm. around like middle to upper class of other people and my thing is like i was accountable for that like i worked through that like i did what i had to do in order to get to where i am and it's made me who i am today mm -hmm. so i don't I, I i don't like when people use external excuses for the answers that are typically internal yep. you know what i mean yeah it's a i mean it's a real topic and there's the whole shut up and dribble conversation and that be, then but also I, I guess that being said i did I should have brought this up earlier, but I, I thought about that with like the intern applications. Again, I haven't looked through a lot of them, yeah. so I don't know what the divide between white, black, Hispanic, you know, Asian, mm -hmm. whatever race wise is. What do, what do you see the responsibility as? Okay, you have two candidates, right? And let's say, let's say, um, I have said because Alex is is big on he wants to add a female to the team. Okay, I think there's insane value in adding a female to the team because there's perspective. We also work with female clients. So even if that female isn't as talented as Alex, okay. they might connect better with our female talent. Well, so in that sense, let's just, might, let's yeah. just say not from like, uh, from a pure, what they're going to bring to your business. Yeah. Let, let's, let's, so cause you're looking long term. Yeah. How let's, is going to land? Let's say it. you have two candidates. How is going to land? It was, okay. I am choosing the best candidate. Okay. Now, there's plenty of, of room to say the best candidate is the best candidate because they've been giving, given advanced schooling, schooling. They've been given advanced. So I, you can't just take it like on a resume. It's almost like brand versus direct response as well. You can kind of talk yourself into why this person is the best candidate, even yeah. if on paper they're not. You could say the female will help us more yeah. in the long run. And, and I could evaluate the fact that someone <laughs> has grinded more and maybe they're not, they don't have the experience because they couldn't afford to take a, you know, a, a free summer internship. Like that's another thing is where if you are, were to just evaluate and say, well, the, the guy who has four summer internships unpaid but is willing to work for free versus this person who really needs to make rent because they don't come from a situation where their parents can help out. So this person has more experience. Are they the better candidate? As long as you can evaluate and say, well, this person's probably the better candidate because they're a harder worker, they're more intelligent, they just have You need the because. Value. I think that's yeah. the important takeaway there. It's like, this, I'm choosing this person. You need to have the because yeah, on if, the end if of it. If it's a completely even playing field, which it rarely is going to be because life happens, I'm taking the better candidate. I don't care. What, I just don't care what you look like. Yeah. I, I don't care. Who, I, I do not care. That's my point. Want, and it just fe I feel like it, it just kind of looks bad because you say, hey, I'm taking the better candidate. It's like, okay, so you're just saying every single time the better candidate is a fucking 26-year-old white male. <laughs> right. It's like, uh, after no, a while. If, as long as you evaluate, yeah. uh, I think that, that it's fair. So I guess the last piece is I did speak out because I, I just – that's how I feel. So like BLM, that was a huge point of, of contention. Uh, COVID, like, you know, seeing people die. And, and I felt like I, w I felt passionate about that. And I lost audience because of it, because of split views. And so I, I, f I have no regrets over that time. And I think as long as you can cope with that. Now, I can't once again. I, I might think that you guys have a responsibility as creators or peoples with platform, but I can't fault you if you say, you know what, I'm not going to speak out on this because because you might screw your business over and then you're screwing your family over and then you're screwing your people over. And so I understand it's tough to kind of pick when to you know, have that responsibility and when to not. But I, I just think the live merger is a good example of don't judge others because you never know when it's going to kind of happen to you. Yeah, I, I actually... It, <laughs> 
as weird as it is, I, I like when the audience starts to cipher off. Like, yeah. I like when people are like, this is not for me. Because I think the people that do stay are even more entrenched in, like, who you are as a person exactly. and what you're doing. So, in those but then, moments... But then there is a risk of you're going to carve an audience that's just... Like, you want different viewpoints. So, so the second kind of leg to the merger is that you had a, a prime example of, you know, people saying morally ethically i'm going to stay here loyalty to the pga tour and to the tradition of it all and then you have the live golfers who are like fuck it i'm out 200 million a year i'm well, gonna take it i i guess i would ask you because the golf is just a monopoly right there's not yeah. like a million different types of golf that you're watching for yeah. a creator you can easily siphon off your off uh, your your audience and those people who left will just go to another person mm -hmm. this is almost i almost feel like the pga or these massive like monopolies do have more responsibility to be open-minded to a lot of people or or look at things more ethically because they make this decision and people could be like oh fuck pga fuck yeah. live etc cetera, etc cetera. and then they're like wait i kind of just want to watch golf on sunday they don't have a choice right you know what i mean and so it's almost like if i was the only creator on youtube and then i started pushing my political views or pushing this agenda or doing something unethical, then I would feel more of a responsibility. Mm -hmm. But So you're saying if you have a bigger platform, you have a bigger responsibility. I I think I don't know if bigger is the right word, but like I this might be just a very specific example. Oh, monopoly. Like if you're a monopoly over whatever you're doing, then I think you have more of a responsibility. I don't know if like bigger because there will always be other options as it relates yeah. to creators, but I think it's good for a creator to have who they are as a person be the forefront of it. But when you're a monopoly, it's like becomes problematic yeah you've got like ncaa not paying their athletes right so and like who's gonna fucking do anything about right it? what's their responsibility the nfl the nfl isn't the prettiest right but in sports we see it all the time if you perform on the field we start to look away from off the field and colin coward's example was if i told you that hitler invented the kit kat are you gonna stop eating kit kats if you really like kit kats yeah you know, it, it's like creators don't have that. Chick-fil-A is the most po second most popular chicken brand in America behind Snapback Kitchen. And <laughs> their, you know, their views are definitely not. But the, you know, LGBTQ plus community eats a Chick-fil-A. So in that situation, they're completely opposed to the viewpoint. So it's just a loaded conversation. But anyways, the money side of it, do you would you as a creator, if you were loyal to a brand, would you feel usurped by by the move? Because these guys were told if you go to the PGA, if you go to live, you can't play in the PGA events. And then they made an exception for the majors. But they turned down hundreds of millions of dollars. I'd be fucking pissed. And just two years later, those people got the money, got to play in the majors, and they already got their tour card back. Yeah, I'd be fucking furious. Like, that's... Uh, I don't know what you could do about it at that point, but... <laughs> right. Is there anything... To do they have, like, a player's union? Uh, yeah. I don't know how golf yeah. works whatsoever. Apparently, they uh, they had a vote about should they let the commissioner slash president go, and and it was pretty overwhelming. Yes, after this yeah. merger but, happened. But is that more just like not petty, but but you know anger, frustration? I can't imagine like how is that? I almost feel like the, you can get sued for that, right? Because the amount of losses that you incurred yeah. by not taking it because you were told that this wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd be furious if this happened with a. If this happened with like a brand that I was working with, I don't know what you can compare this to. No, on. I, I actually think the comp's pretty pretty obvious here. It's like the big Twitch streamers who are getting paid bags to go to a rumble or go mm. to a, a steak where or a kick rather, where the ethics and morals are kind of, you know, up in the air. There's gray areas. And people look down upon people who jump from, you know, the more moral platforms mm. over there for the bags. It's like Eh, maybe you should make that move. It, it's a tough, it's a tough conversation. That one's that one's more difficult, I think, only because creators don't really have the direct connection with the platform. Whereas, like a golfer, right, can yeah. like he could find out where Jay Monahan. Like you could talk face to face and like have yeah. that conversation. You have direct access to whoever is the actual decision maker. Or if you're a creator, but we're talking of creators of scale in these situations. I'm Mr. just talking about in general. Could like speak to the CEO of YouTube. And say, I'm going, unless you pay me, I'm going here. Yeah. Um, so is it his responsibility? Like, is it Mr. Beast's responsibility? This this is a really good thought process. He has the he has the minds of, of the entire next generation, right? His videos get 100 million views. So he's hitting 100 million people. If he wanted to flip them all to degenerate sports betters, 
Is it his responsibility to knock over to kick if they say, hey, we're giving you $5 billion because we know that you're going to turn 100 million kids into sports bet? Is that a responsibility of his? Feels like it is. But for $5 billion, <laughs> it, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I also wonder the people who get themselves like the Mr. Beast, I think a lot of where he the, a lot of where he got and the reason he is where he is is because he's built up so much goodwill about not being that person. But but that's the thing. Can you now cash in on that goodwill? Um, and even if 80% of his audience drops off, it would he could still turn 30 million. It's a, it's just a it's just I, a I thought think, process. I think for me it would come down to whether or not like personally I can sleep at night. Be, right. But but what we always talk about is you got to build trust and transparency and the whole reason you do that is so that, you know, people follow you. So at what point do you cash in? I mean, I don't think there's an equation for it. I think, but you, I'm saying you he do could, in theory, cash in because he's built up all that goodwill. Sure, it would be the last thing he does, maybe because you know people would turn on him and the press would be brutal. But he could still draw a large amount of people over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if I was in that situation, like if I were to have taken the bag, the easy thing would be to get on camera and be like, "Listen, guys, I worked." I worked for the last 20 years every single day to build up what I did. And I hope you guys enjoyed like the videos along the way. I hope I did a lot for a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> I'm tired. I'm taking the bag. Like I'm setting my family up for future success. I hope you can understand that this is not like whatever it is like that. I would be, I would try to be transparent about it in that way. And I don't know up. if it works though. I think it is if you're genuine, but you're going to, uh, there's, there's always going to be questions of you already have enough money. You already like, you don't need this. Like for example, Ronaldo goes to Saudi to play soccer. It's like, do you need the $200 million a year? You don't, but it's also like you're cashing the fuck in. So it's just a, it's a so what are you doing here? Stop asking me ethical questions. I'm, I'm not stop a, a piece of shit. Yeah. I'm not at a place to cash in so much that I think it could ever be worth it. But it's funny during the during the live golf initial kind of run on our on our sports podcast. Even I discussed what is your price to be publicly shamed? Friends and family still you're were cool. all the golfers at what I'm so yeah yeah, yeah they were they just, were like okay. shamed to the point uh, like I said like they were pulling nine eleven like like mm. like they were trying to pull those types of strings. So what's your number? And I think we settled on post tax like fifty million. Like, Is that what they got? Like I would have my brand and rep. No, they got more. Most of them. Like I would have my brand and rep ruined for fifty million dollars as long as my friends and family were cool with it. Like that's but, the thing, though. Like there's no way. There's no way they are. I feel like who oh, your friends? Like you're gonna have friends and family that are like, "What are you doing?" It was a hypothetical, but yeah. but look now. All those people who, if even if their friends and family disagree, now they look them in the face and they're like, "Look." Like, the PGA Tour wasn't any better morally than I was to take the money. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. I don't look at those two things. I'm not a good example of this, though, because money for me is not, like, something. Right. If you give me a million dollars, it's to me, it's the same thing as $5 million. $10 million is the same thing as, like, $30 million to me. Like, the bag but if doesn't someone get... gave you a billion dollars, you wouldn't sell out? That's the thing. Even I just, if you're I, not about money, I don't think everyone, people will but believe me, but probably not. For a billion dollars. Like, what am I going to do with it? I just don't think there was anything that would like actually fulfill me. Yeah. Because th once you do that, then you're like, oh, I could buy all this. You're just rushing. Well, you're rushing a process that you, could, you shouldn't rush. No, but then you could open your creator. Right. But it won't be the same because the, the idea of that in itself is the course of 10 years. It will naturally build up. And we'll have a network of people coming in. You try to rush that. Like we talked about last episode, you can't rush brand. You can't rush real natural process. You're and the I same think, as the Barstool TikTok where one, one of the girls who works there said she wouldn't skip the taylor swift tour for 50 million dollars that's that, that's just what people are gonna i'm just giving you a third i i it. actually saw that clip yeah and i don't believe that person whatsoever i think and are, i'm yeah. sure people are like nick's lying but you know sure i guess i just like to me i get what you're saying yeah I get what you're it saying. all go, it goes back to like what you're doing the process and what I'm makes not, you happy i want to make it clear i am not 
I'm not like that. I'm not saying money's the only thing that fuels me, but it's part of this game that I'm playing that I think if you can cash it, like I'm playing a game where the sports business world, like I navigate it as a game. Like it's challenging, there's levels, there's hurdles, you know, like a video game. And I think at the end of it, what shows I, cha- you know, I beat boss one would be I cashed out and I won, you know, I exited a business or where it became extremely profitable or got to this level. So I am not to say if someone wants to buy Snap Exports for a billion dollars and it's by the Saudi wealth fund, yeah. I, I would consider it for it's, sure. It's like the only way money would sway me is if I ne- if I needed it. You know, again, right. I, I look at money as a tool. So See, it's that's like- interesting because that's actually a point of bad leverage and could get you into a very tricky situation. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, I, I don't think I'd ever take a deal that I felt was unethical. Like, yeah. if I internally was like, this is like, I don't want to be in bed with this person, there's no amount of money that would sway me. Okay, I'll talk about a deal I did during COVID. Okay. <laughs> It's kind of funny. The state of Seattle, or wow, that was terrible. State of Washington, but Seattle specifically paid me money to promote the COVID vaccine. Yeah, ain't no fucking way I touched that. See, I I w- believed like I was a vaccine I person, but vac- I wasn't gonna push that on people. Right. I was a vaccine That's person. That's crazy. You did that? Yeah. Because I was a vaccine person. Where did this content go? It was the most bizarre. Like, why is the state of Washington? Also, yeah, Not how did you get in touch it. with that? Yeah, it was like Dude, COVID was a weird fucked up time. But all right, how much so you, did they pay you? Ten grand. So you've got you've got that. But that's the thing. It wasn't to me. It's just like promoting the Super Bowl. It's like <laughs> that's gonna sound weird. But I I was a believer in the vaccine. Now looking back, maybe the vaccine wasn't the play, or maybe the vaccine wasn't was rushed. Like people are gonna have so many political feelings on it. But at the time, I genuinely believed that people that I should share about the vaccine. Now I had to disclose that I was promoting it. And like, there's a lot of factors to it on the flip. When COVID just started, when I was working for a company, they wanted me to do branded masks and, and profit off the mask. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, this isn't the time that I would be way more into. See, it's so interesting how, you know, we think about that. Like, like they essentially wanted me to do BDGE masks and their thought process was, right, people are going to buy masks. They might as well buy the ones. That, and I was like, to me right now, it just feels, that just doesn't feel right. But Well, that it's like you're only speaking to the people that want to buy masks. I feel like if you're promoting the vaccine in a sense, you're like, I'm right and you're wrong morally. The other one is like, here's a product that if you want to use it in your life, cool. Okay, so... I guess the counter is, do you sell, would you sell like life vests uh, to, you know, someone on a sinking ship? Like masks at the time were considered, right, like necessary and required, you know, items and people were, you know, upselling them essentially. As opposed to the vaccine, the way it was presented was. That's different if you, <laughs> That's like life or death on the spot. Like that's a, dude, that's a, path- dude, that's, but, but during COVID masks work, but there are many alternatives. There are other ways that you can go about. They sick. weren't though. Initially, my mom was going to grocery stores with face masks and fucking gloves on. And we were spraying down Amazon pack. No I, one I, knew. I remember. And this was th- <laughs> I remember clearly, but, but this is, but this was when <laughs> the sinking ship you have literally, you're dead. If you don't put on this life vest, the and, mask is different. You can okay. stay home. Could you, you have could- made an argument that that was kind of the conversation around the vaccine? But, it's not Re- immediate. Rephrase the question. <laughs> My point is the conversation from what we knew at the time was if we don't all get the vaccine, this shit's never going to end and we're all going to die. And the conversation. I was a believer in that. Right. I, I was very open about, you know, I need the vaccine. But in those situations, I guess, I guess my point is like, I speak on the things. If I feel yeah. them strongly internally pulling me, I would never do it from an advertising standpoint. I don't but, think right, that so makes if, you immoral if, or unethical. No, no, no. I just wouldn't personally do it. What if you're already, t- like, I was already pro-vaccine. Now I'm getting paid to talk Yeah, no, nah, I wouldn't do it. And and then the way that the content was presented was, hey, we could be doing all these fun things if everyone got vaccinated. It's a, it's a, it. I, that's why I'm speaking I would, about it. Those, so those things that I feel like are on the blurred lines are things that I would... But you didn't find the masks on the blurred lines. I would talk... Yeah, because you're not forcing your opinion on people. Yeah, you are. You're forcing no. that you think masks are... The, I think that I think what you're looking at is completely different. No, I get that the vaccine's much more intense, but, but how are they different? The mask, you're saying we need to be wearing masks, and I'm saying we should get vaccinated. Uh... 
I don't know. I, I look. I look You're at them. You're a Johnson and Johnson guy, anyways. Um, nah, big big <laughs> Pfizer, big pharma. You know, it's actually man. The quick backstory: the reason this podcast was named Big Content was like a spinoff of Big Pharma. Yeah. So we were like, "Fuck Big Pharma," and we're like, "Fuck Big Content." You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess. Do it, you remember the first logo I ever sent you over had a yeah, syringe it like, in it? Yeah. You were like, you know, I was like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "Go for it. We'll get paid." No, but what about the fact that the whole healthcare industry is a for-profit <laughs> industry? Yeah, that right? seems like it's a question a, for you, asshole, not me, because you're no. out here promoting vaccines. <laughs> no, but think about it. It's like, so what? what is worse about Pfizer marketing than me marketing? I don't want to be I don't want to be a part of Pfizer marketing is what I'm saying. <laughs> but my point is, it, it it is all it is all up for judgment. And I'm judging. <laughs> yeah. And I'm judging that you sold masks. Good. Good. I'm a fucking. I'm actually really newer. I'm interested. Like how in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I actually, I actually am. I think more people would side with me in that selling the masks. See, this is your, you're the problem. Correct. You're the problem Always. because what the whole conversation there? was centered around not judging. And now you're trying to create sides. No. So now you're the one that's like, you're the below who side, who was more fucked up in what they did. <laughs> Who's on, who gets canceled. Who's, right, right. Who is canceled at the end? But I think it, it, whatever, this is a transparent conversation. It's the conversations I think that should be had. And it goes, you know, it gives context to what people are. Now, also, I, also on that note, do you know how many, like the overlap on vaccine people and mask people are, there is a massive portion of people that were like, I don't want to get the vaccine, but I'll wear a mask at any time. That's not overlap. That's what I'm saying. Like the overlap wasn't, those, yeah. are, those are two different groups of people. But I think there was a ton of overlap, people who wore masks. But don't you think? I think people can understand that the mask helped not spread the flu, COVID, mm -hmm. et cetera. Whereas the vaccine was like something very personal that you're telling someone to put into their body. Right, right. And they felt like there might be adverse yeah. effects. They felt no, like. No, I was, it's funny. Mm -hmm. I was very pro vaccine, but I was also very pro holy shit. We're telling people what they should put in their body. Yeah. And if you didn't agree with this, that's a very dangerous game to play. Like, you know, so I, I was fine with people who didn't get the vaccine. It, to I me, just, to I me, just to me it's like, here's a terrible comparison. It's like, you're someone who's pro-life, you know? You're like, you can't get abortions, yeah. and then you go out and sell strollers. Right. I see no problem with that. Interesting. I think. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I didn't think that one through. <laughs> Probably a bad example, but... Uh, I all right. It. It's, uh, a good, it's a good place to land. <laughs> for sure. I don't know where we can go from there. All right. Well, thank you guys for hanging out today. Uh, hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel. Share, rate, review the podcast. And join the Discord for some Q&A, which I'll be releasing, I think, on Friday or something like that. And make sure you go follow uh, Pfizer. Nikki Leaks on Twitter. <laughs> I'll be leaking. I'll be leaking all weekend. When are we going shopping? Uh, apartments. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's my dream to live with you. Actually, uh, did you see? Oh, after seeing Hallie's cooking, you you figured uh, I, I needed that burger need bad. <laughs> yeah. You needed so, it, because if street. you got food poisoning last night, then you wouldn't have to be here at seven in the morning. Uh, you got. I would just have you to take care of me. Right. Um. When what? It's like fucking June. Nah, we got time. We got some time. Yeah. The problem is, if we go looking now, we're not gonna like. It's way too far in advance, I think, to sign anything anyways. Yeah, it's like anything in life. You just kind of want to see what's out there, window shop, understand the vibes. Hallie knows that, that that's your theory on things in life. Sometimes you make the commitment. Serious question, are you mad <laughs> that I'm fucking leaking? Leaking? Nikki leaks? Oh. Uh, no. I, that I'm actually breaking the Dalvin Cook news? I saw you retweeted one of the like most fraudulent Twitter accounts. On I agree, platform. I hate that guy. He's out of control, but he, that was from an article written by someone from like ESPN or something yeah. that he posted. For sure. It's fine. Like if it's, it's fine that I have the day when, when people come back to it, you know, three weeks later and they're like, wow, this guy had the fucking scoop a month ago. Yeah. No, you're still my flow. Our content, we're actually shifting. It's just going to be a bunch of like Jeopardy based uh, TikToks now. So uh, based on my experience doing Jeopardy with you, I feel like that shouldn't be the way that you guys go. It gets a lot of comments. <laughs> if that's how you want to look at it. Engagement is king.